Hey everyone, welcome back to Psych 485. Uh, today we'll be going over Chapter 6, Gathering Performance Information. Okay, let's go. Alright, so today we'll be looking at appraisal forms, characteristics of different appraisal forms, what they need, uh, what they should have, what they shouldn't have, um, how to determine overall ratings, so how, to, how supervisors determine the overall ratings of those uh, who they're evaluating. Um, appraisal periods and the number of meetings. How long should you go between different appraisal meetings, uh, between subsequent appraisal meetings? And how many meetings should you have uh, per, per any given amount of time, per month, per year? Um, this is stuff we'll get into today. Who should provide the performance information? So where is the information coming from? Who's evaluating? Is it just the supervisor? Should it be? Uh, should there be more than one source? We're going to look at rater motivation. So uh, motivations for uh, distorting ratings, maybe giving someone a higher rating than they, than they deserve, a lower rating than they deserve. So we'll look at motivations and how to prevent rater distortion. So how to pre how to prevent raters from giving uh, evaluations or ratings that are too high uh, or too low. Okay, so let's look at appraisal forms. There are nine major components for appraisal forms. Uh, they're listed here, basic employee information, uh, signatures, you want to make sure that um, both people sign and, and have, uh, there's sort of a paper trail, um, so we know that um, this information has in fact been discussed between whichever two parties or multiple parties are involved. Okay, accountabilities, objectives, and standards, we want it to be, uh, you know, the the material or the uh, criteria that the employee is being evaluated on or rated on, uh, it has to be clear and laid out. You know, we, we talked about this in performance management, uh, in terms of performance management all, uh, all quarter. It has to be laid out clearly. Okay, competencies and indicators, okay, so those again have to be laid out clearly as well. Uh, major achievements and contributions of the employee, so it should be clear that the supervisor or whichever source uh, is providing the, the ratings uh, it should be clear that they know what that what that uh, employee or the, you know the yeah what that employee has achieved or what, what they've contributed to the uh, organization. The stakeholder input, so the different uh, raters that are rating um, this employee, um, the employee should know who they are or you know what what they've what they've uh, put into this this rating evaluation. Um, any employee comments, so again, employees should have a, a chance to participate. We've been we've been talking about that all quarter. Developmental achievements, so improvement by the employee should be recognized. Um, and the developmental needs, plans, and goals for the future. Okay, Planning for the future. Uh, again, this development piece was something we've been talking about for a while. Okay, so here are eight desirable features. Um, these are features that the uh, appraisal form should have. Hopefully they do have it, although um, Sometimes due to the nature of the job, uh, maybe not all of these can be included every time. So we have simplicity, relevancy, descriptiveness, adaptability, okay, comprehensiveness, definitional clarity, uh, communication, and time orientation. So again, these are these are things we've been talking about uh, all quarter. You know, they, it should be simple enough so that all parties involved understand. Uh, the you know the the nature of the of the rating mechanism or or uh, you know what's what's going on in in this in this meeting who's rating me what are they rating me on so it should be simple enough to understand it should be relevant to what the employee does it should be descriptive in that it, it gives the employee um, an accurate picture of what he or she uh, is doing um, it should be adaptable no performance management system is set in stone obviously it should be uh, or we're talking about appraisal forms, but again, appraisal forms are part of the performance management system. So, um, like the overall performance management system, appraisal forms should not be set in stone. They should be um, should be able to be adapted to changing uh, situations, changing environments. Uh, comprehensiveness: they should evaluate the employee on everything that he or she has done. Uh, definitional clarity: again, it should be clear. Um, I think this goes with. Uh, probably goes with simplicity a little bit. Um, you know, definitions of performance and uh, work that the employee has done should be clear. Um, there should be communication between uh, the raters 
and the employee, again, it's not a one-way street. There should be open communication and time orientation. The employee should know, um, okay, you're being evaluated on the past month or the past six months, the past year. So the employee should know uh, when, uh, the, the employee should know the time frame um, for which he or she is being evaluated. And he or she should know, you know, we're going to evaluate you again in three months, six months, a year. Okay, so that should be laid out clearly. Okay, let's move on. So how to determine the overall rating? There are a couple different strategies here. Uh, we have the judgmental strategy and the mechanical strategy. Okay, with the judgmental strategy, we're going to consider every aspect of uh, performance. Okay, and we're going to arrive at a defensible summary. So with the judgmental strategy, it's going to be more subjective. The rater or um, raters are going to give uh, sort of a summary of the, the employee's overall performance, and it's going to be, as the name suggests, it's going to be sort of a, it's going to be judgmental in nature and that it's going to be subjective uh, in nature. The raters are going to consider everything that the employee has done and sort of pull it all together into one summary um, that will provide a rating to the uh, to the employee. And that's different from a mechanical strategy. With a mechanical strategy, we're sort of breaking down each piece of the employee's performance into different sections. Okay, so maybe that employee, uh, part of his or her job is you know, data collection, but then that employee also um, has customer-facing duties where he or she has to interact with customers. We're going to break those down into, uh, you know, one section and another section, um, provide ratings or scores for each, and then sort of add these scores together or maybe um, institute some kind of a weighting system. Maybe one is worth more than the other. Um, regardless, we're going to separate, um, sec we're going to separate the employee's performance into sections, into different areas, rate each separately, and then um, sort of combine the ratings or somehow uh, somehow consolidate the ratings. Um, so that's different from a judgmental strategy where it's just an, a consideration of everything at one time and then a summary is provided to the employee. So these are two different strategies. And not to say that one's better than the other, they're just different. Okay, different, different jobs, uh, different workplace environments might call for different strategies. Okay. So what about open-ended comment sections on um, on employee rating forms or in employee rating programs? Well, there's some challenges associated with these. It's difficult to categorize and analyze these comments. You often have to do some kind of thematic analysis where you uh, take the different themes that are in the um, in the comment sections and sort of um, group them into different categories. This can take a lot of time. Um, you often have to have multiple people doing this, so you know it's not subject to any any bias. Um, okay, and the quality and length and the content may vary. You know, some employees may have uh, paragraphs written uh, written about them in the open-ended comment sections and. Um, and again, these comment sections are talking about employees' performance. Okay, so these are raters um, talking about employees' performance. All right, some employees may have a, a paragraph or half a page written about them, and some employees might have a sentence or a word. And you know, it's hard to it's hard to compare employees or give employees uh, fair ratings. Um, you know, to make ratings fair among all employees when you're using um, when you're using feedback that is so that can vary so much between employees, okay, there's it's not standardized. So um, these are some challenges with open-ended comments and uh, some tools suggested here: computer-aided text analysis. Um, I'm not sure about this one because uh, looking at looking at open-ended comments is very subjective. It's open to a lot of interpretation. So when you're using computer-aided tech, computer text analysis, it's sort of just going through and picking out keywords, and um, I, I don't know, I don't think that that captures the, it may not capture the, the real meaning of what the rater was trying to say. You know, there's a lot of subjectivity involved. It often takes um, a person to actually go in, read the text, and then form some kind of meaning out of it. I'm not sure if computer text 
um, analysis that just pulls out keywords is really capturing that. Um, okay, so establish goals of information provided. If you provide goals to the raters and say, we want you to speak about this in your open-ended comment in relation to the employee, then you know it may um, it may serve to um, develop some kind of standard across the different responses, which is a good thing. Um, training in systematic and standardized rating skills. So we're going to talk about uh, training the raters a little bit later in this uh, in this PowerPoint. So we'll move on for now. Okay, let's look at the appraisal period. Um, so the number of meetings, is it annual? Um, is it semi-annual? Is it quarterly? Is it monthly? So these are things you, you want to consider um, when, uh, when considering information gathering um, and, uh, you know, feed and review meetings. So, again, this is just going to vary um, due to the nature of the job. Um, you know, are, are there quarterly sales goals that you want to evaluate every, um, you know, every, uh, every quarter? Let the employee know how he or she is doing um, or collect information every, uh, every quarter. You want to collect it every six months. Does, does the company have some, some, or the organization have some kind of uh, six months goal, six month goal? Um, do you want to collect it annually? You know, is it, is it seasonal? Do you only hit that goal in the summertime or in the winter time, you know, um, and you want to gather information every year and provide reviews every year. Okay, so these are things you want to consider and it's just going to vary with the nature of the job. Okay, when the review is completed. Um, so another thing you want to consider when the information is gathered and the employee review is completed um, you know, it may be that rewards are um, tied to every year, so you may want to um, have these yearly information gathering and review. Uh, you may want to gather your information every year and have reviews every year. Um, again, these are all things we, we've just talked about. It's, it's the nature of the job. I mean, if goals, you know, if you're meeting goals every year, um, then you might want to have a yearly meeting. Um, but it may be a burden on the supervisor to have it every year. Maybe he, maybe the supervisor wants to have it every six months, so he or she has more information for his or her own job. So again, it's just going to depend on the type of on the type of job. Okay. All right. Six types of formal meetings, and again, these can be combined into um, sort of multiple. Um, like multi-style rating systems, okay? It's not just pick and choose. You don't just have to pick and choose one. You can certainly combine different types of uh, different types of meetings um, into your uh, into your evaluation or your review uh, your review plan or your information gathering techniques, okay? So system inauguration, self appraisal. Uh, classical performance review, merit or salary review, development plan, and objective setting. Okay, these are these are fairly straightforward, and and um, you know they're out, they're outlined in your book, so I won't go over each one now. I feel like I'd just be being redundant. So go ahead and, and take a look at each of those in a bit more detail in your uh, in your text, please. Um, so who should be providing performance information? Uh, this is very important. This is this actually has to do with our discussion this week. Um, so our discussion this week is our, a couple videos on on 360 degree uh, feedback, which is feedback from multiple sources. Um, and okay, so let's talk about um, who should provide this information. So employees should be involved, again, um, something we've talked about a lot, employees should be involved in this process as they should with the overall performance management process. So employees should be involved in selecting which sources evaluate um, them, which performance dimensions they're evaluated on. So again, this is the employee participation piece. Um, you don't want sources evaluating um, employees if it's not relevant, okay? If the employee is not uh, a customer-facing uh, employee, 
then you wouldn't have customers uh, writing. You wouldn't be surveying customers to see how this employee is performing. Okay, you wouldn't be using customer satisfaction forms to um, to evaluate an employee. It's not uh, it's not relevant. So this is why employees should have some input into the into the process. Okay, and when employees are actively involved they're more likely to accept the results. They're more likely to take the results and incorporate it into their own personal development. Okay, that participation piece that we've been talking about all, all quarter. Okay, ownership in the program, very important. Okay, and a more and perception that the system is fair. Obviously, if they are um, involved in the process of picking who is providing the evaluations, they're going to perceive that um, that the process is more fair. Okay, so some more on who should provide direct, who, whoever has direct knowledge of employee performance should be providing uh, ratings, should be providing information about the employee. So these are supervisors, uh, peers, subordinates, and customers. Okay, but remember, only if it's relevant, like, like we said with the last slide, you wouldn't have customers providing ratings or information about an employee that's not uh, customer facing. That wouldn't make sense. You wouldn't have um, subordinates um, providing ratings about um, you know a supervisor that's not their direct supervisor if they don't know that supervisor that well if they don't work with that supervisor very often then subordinates uh, wouldn't provide ratings for that supervisor and the same with the other direction a supervisor wouldn't provide ratings for a subordinate if he or she does not work with that subordinate very often okay so let's talk about each of these in just a little bit more detail. Um, supervisors, some advantages to using supervisors. They're in, an, they're in a position where they can hopefully, you know, hopefully they've, hopefully they have this ability since they've been promoted to the supervisor position. They can evaluate performance versus strategic goals. They know the overall strategic goals of the company. They have a good handle on them and they can tie um, employee performance or subordinate performance to these strategic goals. Okay, they can make decisions about rewards. Um, they're able to differentiate among performance dimensions. Okay, again, this this sh hopefully they would have this ability as a supervisor, uh, being able to look at different performance dimensions and say, okay, you're performing well here, but not so much here. Let's you know let's do something to take care of that. Um, and some disadvantages, supervisors may not be able to directly observe uh, performance. If the supervisor doesn't work directly with the subordinate, he or she may not be uh, in a position. Again, this has to do with relevancy. If the supervisor isn't in a position to, um, if the supervisor doesn't have an understanding of the employees or the subordinate's work, then, then he or she should not be uh, providing ratings. So sometimes supervisors are not always um, they're not always aware of the subordinates' performance, um, you know, their entire performance. They might, they might only see one piece of it, and this could be a disadvantage. Okay, what about peers? Um, so the main advantage of peers is that peers can assess teamwork. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. That's, that's definitely the big advantage of peers. But some disadvantages, there may be some bias due to friendships. Peers work together. Um, by definition, um, they work together a lot. They're around each other a lot, so there may be some kind of uh, bias in the ratings. You know, friendships may cause peers to inflate ratings. Um, if there's some kind of conflict between peers, um, ratings might be artificially deflated. You know, somebody might give a peer a poor rating if they've just worked on a project and had a poor interaction with that peer. Okay. Uh, what about subordinates? Um, subordinates can be used, um, okay, so with subordinates we're talking about subordinates rating supervisors, okay? So an advantage, is, an advantage of this is um, it can be very accurate when you're using it for developmental purposes. If you want the supervisor to improve on his or her uh, supervisory skills, um, it's very valuable to have the view and the opinions of subordinates. Because um, they're in a good position to assess um, the skills that make a good supervisor, obviously. They are the ones being supervised. But some disadvantages, uh, if, the, if the ratings are going to, 
affect the supervisor's role in some way. Maybe the ratings are going to be used for a promotion. Maybe the ratings are going to be used for bonuses. Um, this may cause subordinates to, or if the supervisor knows um, which, you know, is aware of which subordinates are giving which ratings, if, if the supervisor knows somehow, then the subordinates may inflate uh, the ratings to please the supervisor, to get the supervisor that promotion, to get the supervisor that raise. So um, we have to be uh, careful of that, of subordinates inflating ratings just to please the supervisor. Okay. Or if they fear some kind of retaliation from the supervisor. And customers, how are customers useful in providing ratings? Well, customer-focused employees, um, certainly if this is their main job function, then obviously customers are going to be the best ones to uh, evaluate them. Okay, But the disadvantage is time and money. It takes a lot of time, and uh, it takes a lot of time to gather information and ratings from a large group of customers. It also takes a lot of money. Um, often you have to provide some kind of compensation to get customers to... Uh, to provide ratings because most of the time they just may not care or may not want to take the time to provide ratings so after after you often have to offer them some kind of uh, monetary incentive okay all right let's move on to disagreement how do you handle disagreement across different sources well you should expect disagreement obviously no two people are going to think uh, alike uh, maybe some sources have some Maybe, maybe some sources have been working with an employee for much longer than, than other sources and thus have a better picture of how, uh, of, how this of how the employee who is being rated, uh, how that employee operates. Okay. Um, you want to make sure that the employee is receiving his or her feedback by source. You want to make it clear that this rating is coming from a supervisor, this rating is coming from a uh, co-worker, a peer, um, so the employee knows where, um, you know, where he or she may be doing well or where he or she may be doing not so well. And again, this is going to play into the development piece, how to improve uh, after, after uh, hearing these ratings, after being given these ratings. Okay. And assigning different weights. You can assign a dif different weights to different scores as well. Uh, maybe maybe uh, customer ratings matter much more than um, subordinate ratings or peer ratings, okay? So assigning different weights to uh, ratings from different sources uh, may help to provide a more fair overall rating. Okay. Let's look at types of rating errors. Rating inflation or deflation, so again, intentionally giving somebody a higher rating than, than they deserve, um, intentionally giving someone a lower rating than they deserve. And then unintentional errors. Um, if, a, if a subordinate is, this is just an example, if a subordinate is rating a supervisor, if the subordinate does not understand the complexity of the supervisor's role, he or she may not be able to give an accurate rating. Okay, so here's a model of rater motivation. So basically you have two paths here. Um, you can look at this one right here, this is the motivation to provide accurate rating. Okay, so that's one, this is sort of one main path right here. Um, and then the motivation to distort ratings, this is the second path right here. Um, and they both lead to rating behavior. Um, rating behavior just means, you know, the, the, the type of rating or the degree, the magnitude of a rating that a rater is going to provide. And here are some sort of precursors to the to the motivation. This box right here is the same as, as this box right here. This, this box right here is the same as this box right here. Okay, so expected consequences, the, prob the probability of the rater experiencing positive or negative consequences. Okay, um, this is going to lead to the motivation to provide accurate ratings and eventually rating behavior. And again, the same thing, expected, expected consequences and experience, the probability of experiencing uh, positive or negative consequences. Okay, This is motivation to distort ratings. So we have these two paths, 
both being influenced by the same factors here. And this is going to lead to the type of rating that the, that the rater provides. Okay, so what are some motivations for rating inflation? We talked about some just before. Um, if you remember the subordinate giving the supervisor a higher rating if the supervisor uh, knows um, what, who is providing the ratings. If he's aware of who is providing what ratings, then uh, the, uh, the subordinates might fear retaliation. Okay, that's just one example. But So why do raters inflate their information, why, or their uh, ratings? Why do they give ratings that are too high? Um, well, they might want to and this is any level. This could be supervisor down to subordinate. This could be customer to customer rating uh, um, employees. This could be peers rating each other. Okay, so to encourage employees, maybe a supervisor wants to encourage his or her subordinates and gives them higher ratings than they deserve. Um, maybe they want to avoid paperwork or avoid avoid extra work that might come with giving a low rating. Maybe they want to avoid confrontation. Um, or maybe they want to make uh, the manager look good. Maybe the subordinate wants to make the manager look good. Okay. Or maybe the manager or supervisor wants to make him or herself look good by giving all of his or her employees really high ratings. Okay. So these are all motivations for giving ratings that are too high. All right. So what are some motivations for giving ratings that are too low? Rating deflation. Um, to teach employees a lesson, okay, so if a supervisor wants to teach his or her subordinates a lesson, to send a message or to build a, a written record. You know, we talked about, we just talked about not wanting to do paperwork, but maybe we have a situation where a supervisor really wants to send a message and create a record of an employee's poor performance just so it doesn't reflect badly on the supervisor. Maybe that supervisor will give, um, will give that employee a poor rating just so he or she has to fill out a disciplinary form and then there's a written record of it. Okay, that's always a possibility. Okay. So let's move on to preventing rating distortion. This will sort of be our last section today on this PowerPoint. So Preventing distortion through training programs. So what do these training, training pro programs cover? Um, the information that's being used as uh, for, or not as, uh, excuse me, information that's being used for the ratings. Um, the motivation, so this motivation chart that we looked at, this should be gone over uh, with anybody who's providing ratings, uh, if possible. I don't, I don't think we'd be able to go over this with customers, but, you know, anyone, any internal uh, employees that are internal to the organization, you can certainly go over this model or something like it with them, just to just so they're aware of, uh, just so they might be just so they might be more aware of their own uh, mental mental processes or rating processes, subconscious processes usually. Um, what else? How to interact with employees when they receive the information? So preparing raters for possible negative reactions from those who they are rating. Okay, so um, in reasons for uh, reasons for possibly inflating a rating that we just talked about, one of them was avoiding confrontation. So if, say, a, say a, a, um, a peer is afraid that another peer might react poorly to a poor rating, um, if you prepare this rater for a possible negative reaction and sort of teach them how to react, how to handle a negative reaction from a peer, um, they might be, they might feel more comfortable to give an accurate rating. Okay, so preparing, um, preparing employees to interact with each other when giving each other certain ratings, certainly very important. Okay, um, and just how to identify, observe, and record um, performance. Okay, so just the proper methods of gathering information are, are going to lead to uh, more accurate ratings. Okay, you want to 
keep the keep anybody who's providing any ratings informed of how the system is going to work. Okay, the reasons for imp implementing the performance management system or the rating system um, and the information that's going to be on the appraisal forms. So this just has to do with employee involvement, uh, ownership in the process, keeping employees aware of why we're doing this, what it's going to be used for. It's going to ensure that it's going to lead to more uh, compliance, you know, more accurate, more accurate ratings. So if an employee or a peer knows that, hey, if I if I give this person a, an, an inaccurate rating, it's really going to screw with our team's overall performance. You know, it's going to lead to a lot of problems in the long run. So as uncomfortable as it may be, I have to provide an accurate rating. Okay, so awareness of the consequences, awareness of how the system works um, is probably going to lead to more accurate ratings, hopefully. Okay, so the, this is sort of what we just talked about, benefits of providing accurate ratings. So maybe an accurate, maybe more accurate ratings will lead to better team performance down the road. Okay, um, and then giving employees, giving any anybody who's doing any rating, giving those people the tools for, for providing uh, accurate ratings. So maybe certain forms or, um, you know, uh, certain, well, I guess this tra a training session could be a tool for providing accurate ratings, um, supplying uh, anybody who's doing ratings with information about uh, how to do it, how the process, you know, what to look for, um, what to focus on when, when providing ratings. So, okay. job activities okay uh, sort of what we just talked about how to how to do it how to observe how to record how to measure um, what to look for with certain job activities what's the most important to what's the least important you know are, are they doing the most important thing really well maybe they're doing the least important thing not so well but it doesn't make a big difference because it's the least important thing um, so knowing what's important and what's not important and being able to see how an employee or how yeah, how an employee is performing uh, in each of these different areas um, is very important. Will lead to accurate ratings, hopefully, um, and more deserved ratings. Okay. Okay, so how do we interact with employees when they receive uh, their information? Um, so how to conduct the interview, how to, how to convey uh, rating information to an employee, um, you know, and this can be good or bad information. You know, I think, I think what we, what I think about mostly, and maybe, maybe what y'all think about too, is, is providing poor ratings. You know, how an employee is going to react when you provide a poor rating, are they going to um, become angry or, uh, you know, agitated or, you know, are they going to start yelling at you or storming out of the room? Uh, these are certainly all possibilities. So um, how to conduct that, uh, how to conduct that session, how to provide those ratings in a way that doesn't incite a lot of anger, um, but also giving good ratings as well. You don't want employees to, you know, you don't, you don't want to say to an employee, oh, you're doing so great everything you do is perfect and have that employee leaving the meeting saying, wow, you know, I, I, I'm doing so well, maybe I don't even need to be trying as hard. I can, I can kind of slack off a little bit and, and my, my ratings will probably be just as high next time. You know, I'm already, I'm already doing so well now. Um, you don't want that to happen. So how to, how to provide even not just bad ratings, but, uh, positive ratings as well, um, in a way that sort of, in a way that inspires the employee to keep keep it up and not not slack off. All right, so a quick review. We looked at appraisal forms, what should be on them, what shouldn't be on them, what's ideal. Um, but again, appraisal forms are going to vary um, depending on the job or the job environment. Okay, um, determining overall ratings, so looking at only the relevant areas or maybe the most important areas versus the least important areas um, and how to how to look for, yeah how to look for the most important things how to actually measure 
uh, performance? Are you looking at what's important? Okay, Appra appraisal period and the number of meetings. Or do you want to work on an annual schedule, uh, a semi-annual schedule, biannual? Bi -annual, um, is it monthly? This is all going to, to depend on your organization and the environment. You know, what are what are your organization's goals? How often do you want uh, employee information, employee rating uh, information? Okay. So who should be providing the performance information? So we looked at a different a, di a number of different sources, uh, customers, employees, supervisors, peers. Um, we looked at the model of rater motivation. What motivates raters to give positive uh, inflated ratings or negative deflated ratings? Um, and then preventing this distortion, preventing these um, inflated and deflated ratings through training programs, making these raters aware of what they're rating, what to look for, making them aware of maybe some subconscious processes that go on that lead to inaccurate ratings. Uh, okay, that's about it. Thank you all for listening. Bye-bye.